Hey, it's great to be back with you all today. We've made it all the way to Revelation chapter 10. Woohoo! <laughs> Chapters 10 to 14 <clears throat> describe the events that take place in the middle of this seven year time period called the tribulation. That's why John is going to keep mentioning this three and a half year time frame in one form of for another. He'll mention it in chapter 11 and chapter 12 and 13. And if you've been with us all along the way, you'll recall that this person uh, called the Antichrist begins his first three and a half years promising to protect the Jews and assist them as they rebuild the temple. But now, halfway through this tribulation, he will break his agreement, invade the temple, and begin to persecute the Jews, the Jewish people, ruthlessly. But the thing is, and this is what we're going to be looking at today mostly, and that even though the events which take place in the middle of this tribulation are somewhat depressing, God is not without a witness to the world. In fact, this is my key thought for us today. This is my take it out the door with you, if you will. And it's this, that when God provides a supernatural witness, we should pay very close attention. Let me say that again. When God provides a supernatural witness, we should pay very close attention. Let me pray, uh, and then we'll dig in, and I'll show you what I mean. Father, we ask you to be with us today as we turn to your word. Help us to understand this with great clarity, and uh, I just pray that you will bless us for spending time in your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. So, some of you are aware that uh, my wife Julie and I spent many years working with youth, we started uh, with Awana back when our oldest uh, son, Jim, was five years old. And then after about 17 years of that, we switched into high school ministry. And one of my favorite events each year was our Super Bowl party. We would take the church's projector and set it up in the gymnasium on a super big screen and hook up the church's uh, gigantic sound system and run a TV cable over to it and broadcast a great big uh, screen effect, about 16 feet wide. And and all we asked was that you bring a snack or a dessert to share. And you can imagine we all gained weight during the Super Bowl party. <laughs> but what was always fun to watch was the way the kids would have this running contest about what commercials were the best. They would even vote on them. And then there were the halftime shows. Some of you might recall the famous wardrobe malfunction when Justin Timberlake and Janet Jackson were on the stage. The wardrobe malfunction actually caused us to have to get even higher tech, uh, get more techy and install a delay on the projector so that we weren't broadcasting live as a church and we had the opportunity to cut the video feed in the event that anything appropriate, inappropriate was being broadcast. I say all that to say that the halftime show was for many of the kids and the parents, the highlight of the party, and it seemed that each year they tried to outdo all the previous years. Well, here we are almost to the halfway point in this uh, period uh, known as the tribulation. And we have followed along as Jesus has opened the seven seals. And we've watched as the seventh seal brought seven trumpets. And now it's like we're going to get a halftime show. And some supernatural witnesses are going to make their debut in the narrative. There are three important testimonies that are going to be given, and we're going to look at them today. The first will be Roman numeral uh, number one, if you're taking notes, and it is the testimony of the mighty angel. Let's pick it up here in Revelation chapter 10, verse 1. Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, wrapped in a cloud, with a rainbow over his head, and his face was like the sun and his legs like pillars of fire. He had a little scroll open in his hand, and he set his right foot on the sea, and his left foot on the land, and called out with a loud voice, like a lion roaring. Now allow me to pause us there, because this is an entering shift, an interesting shift as this halftime show gets underway. What I mean by that is, some scholars have noted that the language John uses here is usually reserved for the Lord Jesus. In fact, you could write this down as letter A if you're taking notes today. Letter A, this witness could be Jesus. 
This witness could well be Jesus. There are over 60 references to angels in the book of Revelation. What makes this angel special then? The term uh, translated strong angel is from the Greek word mighty. We saw, uh, it's the Greek word for mighty. We saw the similar description back in chapter 5, verse 2. Now, it's important to remember that all angels are very strong. And they excel in strength. We learned that in Psalm 103. But if you will recall, if you were back with us in the early days of this series, we saw first saw the rainbow around the throne of God back in chapter 4. And now the rainbow sits like a crown on the head of this particular messenger. By the word, angelos means messenger in the Greek. And it was one of those words, they just brought it over into English and adopted it rather than translating it. So anytime you're reading the word angel, you could just be reading in English the word messenger. But apparently some angels have greater authority and power than others. You'll remember from your Old Testament that the rainbow was God's sign. His promise to mankind that he would never again destroy the world by flood, no matter how angry his wrath, God promises to remember his mercy. Whoever this messenger is, he has the authority of God's throne given to him. The language here is very similar to Ezekiel chapter 1. In fact, allow me to read verses 26 through 28. Listen to Ezekiel's description. And above the firmament, there was over their heads uh, the likeness of a throne as the appearance of a sapphire stone. And upon the likeness of the throne was a likeness of the appearance of a man above it. And I saw, as it were, glowing metal as the appearance of fire within it around about from the appearance of his loins and upward and from the appearance of his loins and downward I saw as it were the appearance of fire and there was brightness around about him as the appearance of the bow that is in the clouds in the day of rain so was the appearance of the brightness round about that was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of Jehovah and when I saw it I fell on my face and I heard the voice of one that spoke. Hmm. Legs of fire, rainbow, glory of Jehovah, all absolutely terrifying. God was frequently associated with clouds. There was the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. Clouds covered Mount Sinai when God gave Moses the law. And when God appeared to Moses, it was within a cloud of glory. The psalmist declares that God makes the clouds his chariot. And of course, when Jesus ascended to heaven, as is reported in the book of Acts, he ascended in a cloud. And it tells us that when he returns, he will return the same way. This description of the angel's face as the sun corresponds to the description that John gave of Jesus back in Revelation chapter 1, verse 16, and, and his description of his feet correspond to John's description of Jesus in chapter 1, verses 15. And when he says his voice was, quote, like a lion, end quote, it suggests Revelation chapter 5, verse 5. Jesus often appeared in the Old Testament as the angel, an angel of the Lord, Exodus chapter 3, Judges chapter uh, 2, uh, and chapter 6, and in 2 Samuel chapter 24. I think what John is describing here for us is a temporary manifestation for a special purpose. A temporary manifestation for a special purpose. The Lord Jesus himself paid the ultimate price for our sin. He was without shame, and he took all of our shame upon himself on the cross, all of our sin. And now here he is to a planet, coming to a planet that has rejected him, and to this rebellious angel called Satan and his demonic horde, and the humans that are now worshiping Satan, Jesus is preparing to make a declaration. There's a couple other hints here. One of them is the little scroll in his hand, which contains the remainder of this prophetic message that John will deliver. 
you'll remember that only Jesus was able to take the scroll and break the seals back in chapter 5. So one might conclude that only the Lord Jesus is the one worthy to give his servant the rest of the message. In addition to that, we can look at his body language. The angel's posture here is like a conqueror taking possession of his, uh, of his territory. And this messenger, this conqueror, is claiming the entire world. What, what conqueror could make such a claim legitimately? Of course, the answer is legitimately only Jesus could. As we will see in the weeks ahead, uh, soon the Antichrist will complete his conquest and force the whole world to submit to his control. But before that happens, heaven claims the world for itself, and Jesus claims the inheritance that God the Father promised him. Satan roars like a lion to frighten his prey, but this lion roars to announce victory. Okay, that brings us to, for, to verse 4. The Bible says, And the angel, or the messenger whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land, did you notice that he is on the sea, not in it? Huh, what does that remind you of? He raised his hand, right hand to heaven, and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created the heavens and what is in it, the earth <clears throat> and what is in it, and the sea and what is in it, that there would be no more delay, but that in the days of the trumpet call to be sounded by the seventh angel, the mystery of God would be fulfilled, just as he announced to his servants the prophet prophets. So some people ask, if this angel is the Lord Jesus, why would he take an oath? One possible answer is, in order to affirm the certainty and the solemnity of this declaration. We actually do see God put himself under oath in the Old Testament. He did so when he made his covenant with Abraham. And in fact, the writer of Hebrews emphasizes this in chapter 6, verse 13. Just let me read a brief part of that passage by way of reminder here for us. For when, God's, when God made promise to Abraham, since he could swear by none greater, he sweared by himself, saying, Surely, blessing, I will bless thee, and multiplying, I will multiply thee, and thus, having patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men swear by the greater, and in every dispute of theirs, the oath is final for confirmation wherein God, being minded to show more abundantly unto the heirs of the promise the immutability of his counsel, interposed with an oath that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we may have a strong encouragement, who we who have fled for refuge, to lay hold of the hope set before us, which we have as an anchor to the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast in entering into that which is within the veil. As we see in verse 6 the of Revelation here, the emphasis is on God, the Creator. We've already seen the opening of the seals, the first six trumpet blasts, and that judgments have been felt by heaven. They have been felt by the earth and, and by the people, and more judgments are on their way. But God has actually been delaying judgment for generations upon generations. In our Sunday morning men's Bible study on the book of 2 Peter, which we just concluded, Peter reminds the church that in the last days, mockers will come. And they'll ask, where is the promise of Jesus' coming? And Peter reminds us and the church that the Lord is not slow about his return, but desiring that all would have the opportunity to repent. So remember back in chapter 6, those saints who were before the throne who had been martyred for their faith, they were concerned about God's apparent delay. We need to remember his word is true and his timing is perfect. <laughs> this is comforting news to those of us in the body of Christ. 
and a terrifying reminder of judgment to come for sinners, especially unrepentant ones. What about this, what about this word uh, that's translated mystery? What is this mystery of God that, that John is talking about that is going to be fulfilled? In the Bible, a mystery is a sacred secret, a truth, if you will, that is hidden to those who are outside but is revealed to God's people by his word. You'll recall back in Matthew chapter 13, when the disciples came to Jesus and they asked him, why are you speaking in parables? And his answer was telling. He answered them, he says, it is given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but it is not given to them. To them it is not given. This mystery of God has to do with the age-old problem of evil in the world. The question that asks, why is there moral and natural evil? Why doesn't God do something about it? And this is a question that many of us have had to wrestle with at some point or another in our lives. Why did God allow this evil thing or this situation that we had to go through? Of course, we believe that God did do something about evil at Calvary when the sinless one was made to be sin for us. We often forget, don't we, that the wrath which should have been poured out on every one of us was poured out on Christ so we would not have to face God's wrath. See, here's the thing to remember. Since God himself has paid the price for sin, he is free to delay his judgment without being accused of injustice or unconcern. And now today we see at this point in time, God is allowing evil to increase. But someday he will say, enough. I actually had the German word genug come to mind. <laughs> Dort sind genug. That's, a, that's enough. The world will be ripe for judgment. Check out Second Thessalonians. I might have just spoken in tongues there. That's weird. Um, <laughs> technically, I think I did speak in a foreign language. Uh, Thessalonians chapter, uh, Second Thessalonians chapter two. Wow, I got myself off track here. Verse seven and following, if you're taking notes. There is a sign. There is a sign that this mystery is now complete. And, the, and that sign is the sounding of the seventh trumpet, which is going to happen in just a few words here in chapter 11, which God talks about. It talks about God's wrath being poured out. And this mighty messenger gives John some instruction, uh, beginning in verse 8. The Bible says, Then the voice that I had heard uh, from heaven spoke to me again, saying, Go take the scroll that is in the hand of the angel who is standing on the land and on the sea. So I went to the messenger and told him to give me the little scroll. And he said to me, Take it and eat it. It will make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. And I took the little scroll from the hand of the angel and I ate it. It was sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach became bitter. And I was told, you must again prophesy about many peoples and nations and languages and kings. These verses highlight for us, for you and I, the need to assimilate the Word of God and make it part of our inner person. All throughout Scripture, we see God's Word compared to food. He calls it bread in Matthew. He calls it milk in 1 Peter. He calls it meat in 1 Corinthians and, and honey in the Psalms. We need to do more than just echo God's Word. It needs to be a living part of our very being. See, friends, God will not force his word upon us. He will not force it upon you. He will not force it upon me. He will not force us to receive it. He hands it to us, and we need to take it. The truth of the matter is, God's word will bring joy and sorrow, sweetness 
and bitterness, just as John describes. God's word contains sweet promises, but it also contains dire warning. We Christ followers are witnesses in the here and now. Paul talks about these polar opposites in the book of 2 Corinthians. He says, thanks be to God who leads us in triumph in Christ and makes manifest through us the savor. Ooh, I like that word. The savor of his knowledge in every place to the one a sweet savor. It means, it means taste or smell or aroma to the one a sweet aroma of Christ to those who are saved. But to the other, the savor of death. Sweet promises, hard truths. God's word doesn't shy away from either. And neither should we. And, and chapter 10 closes with John being told to prophesy again. As chapter 11 opens up, it brings us to our second uh, point of today's message. Roman numeral number two, and that is the testimony of the two witnesses. Let me tell you, these guys are something else. Remember, when God provides a supernatural witness, we should pay very close attention. The scene here is Jerusalem, and the setting is the first half of the tribulation. At this point, Israel is worshiping again in the restored temple. You'll recall that at the start of the tribulation, the Antichrist will make a peace agreement with Israel, promising them political peace. And at this point, his true character has not yet been put on display. Revelation chapter 11, the Bible says, Then I was given a measuring rod like a staff. And I was told, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there. But do not measure the court outside of the temple. Leave that out, for it is given over to the nation, and they will trample the holy city for 42 months. And I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1260 days, clothed in sackcloth. These, these two witnesses have actually been ministering during the first half of the tribulation. So we take 42 months. We divide by 12 and we get three and a half years, 3.5. Halfway through this seven-year period of time known as the tribulation, we are about to enter the last three and a half years known as the Great Tribulation. We take the 1260 days, we divide it by 30, and we get 42 months. John's being pretty specific here about this three and a half year time frame. Now, some scholars attempt to spiritualize verses 1 and 2 and, and make the temple be a reference that refers to the church, but doing this creates a, several serious problems. For one, how could John measure an individual body of people, even if the church were still on earth? If the temple is the church, then who are the worshipers? And, and what is the altar being measured? Ephesians makes it pretty clear that the church unites both the Jews and Gentiles into one body. So why should the Gent why would the Gentiles be segregated then in, in this picture, that, this word picture we're reading? I think it's the better view to see this as the actual temple in the city of Jerusalem. The measuring of the temple is a symbolic action. By that, I mean, when you measure something, you're kind of claiming it. <laughs> it's like when you sell your house and the buyers have signed the paperwork, but maybe they haven't taken possession yet or haven't moved in, and they send their contractor in to take some measurements because they're going to adapt the house to their personal taste before they move in. Now, I just got to say that as a previous contractor type person, had I simply shown up uninvited at someone's house to start measuring and if I had announced I was going to rip it up, I'm pretty sure they would have called the cops. But in this passage, the Lord is saying through John, this is my city. This is my temple. I'm claiming both of these here. If you want to drill deeper down into this, check out Ezekiel chapter 40 and 41 or Zechariah chapter 2. I'll repeat that so you can write this down if you're taking notes. Ezekiel 40 and 41 and Zechariah chapter 2. 
But here's what I want you to take away, though. This is pretty significant. The Gentiles, by this point in the, in the tribulation, have taken over Jerusalem. The Antichrist has broken his agreement with Israel, and now he's about to use the temple for diabolical purposes. We'll see more on this when we get to chapter 13. Back in Luke, Jesus uh, says, Jerusalem will be trodden down by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Luke 21, 24. The times of the Gentiles began, began 600 years before Christ when Babylon began to devastate it, and it will continue until Jesus returns to deliver the holy city and redeem Israel. John continues, verse 4, chapter 11. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. And if anyone would harm them, fire pours out of their mouth and consumes their foes. <laughs> wow. If anyone would harm them, this is how he is doomed to be killed. you got to wonder, how many of the ancient prophets wished that they had had the ability to pour out fire on their foes? These guys aren't messing around. Verse 6. They have the power to shut the sky so that no rain may fall during the days of their prophesying. And they have the power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they desire. And when they have finished their testimony, the beast that rises from the bottomless pit, remember the abyss, we looked at that last week, will make war on them and conquer them and kill them. It's a shame when you think about it that these supernatural witnesses have to be outside the temple and not within. Huh. There are three aspects of these two witnesses. Uh, we're going to put these down as A, B, C uh, fairly quickly here. Write this one down this, uh, as letter A. The first aspect that we're going to look at is their ministry. Uh, their ministry. These two men are specifically called prophets in verses uh, 3 and verse 6. I think they are functioning in the same manner of prophetic ministry that we saw in the Old Testament, right down to their clothing, calling both Jews and Gentiles alike to repent and return. Repent and return to the true God of Israel. As they prophesy, they perform two functions. You can write these down as number one and number two. Number one, the first function is to declare God's word. To declare God's word. These guys are out there on the street for three and a half years speaking truth to the world situation. These guys are not only declaring God's word, but also his works. Write this down as number two. They are performing God's miracles. They perform God's miracles. Not only are they speaking truth to the situation, but they are calling down judgment, calling down plagues, performing supernaturally manifested executions upon their enemies or those that would try to kill them. They remind us of Moses and Elijah. Some, some scholars try to cite Malachi chapter 4 to identify one of them as Elijah, but that that really doesn't work so well since Jesus personally applied that prophecy to John the Baptist in Matthew chapter 17. Although John the Baptist did deny that he was Elijah returned to the earth, I suppose it's safe to say that God sends special people in the manner of Elijah's <laughs> to call people to repentance. Not only do we see the aspect of their ministry as letter A, uh, but now write this aspect down as letter B. We see the aspect of their martyrdom. This doesn't happen until they have completed their testimony. Julie used to have this sign. I think it was on a refrigerator, or maybe it was her mom. It said, and I think I'm remembering it right, the man of God in the will of God is immortal until their work is through. But now, halfway through the tribulation, the two witnesses have to face off against the beast, who is now in power and wants to take over the temple. 
But in order to do that, this beast has got to get God's servants out of the way. God will actually allow the beast to slay them. Chapter 13, verse 4 says, No one is able to make war against the beast and win. Look what happens in verse 8 and 9 here. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city that symbolically is called Sodom and Egypt where their Lord was crucified. For three and a half days, some of the people uh, from tribes and languages and nations will gaze at their dead bodies and refuse to let them be placed in a tomb. I wouldn't be surprised if it turns out or it ends up being that these guys are killed in the very spot Jesus was crucified. I wouldn't be surprised. It doesn't have to happen. That's just a personal guess of mine, I guess. <laughs> The sad thing is, these guys don't even get a decent human burial. you got to know that during the three and a half years that they were performing their ministries, the TV cameras were on these guys nonstop. There were probably witness cams just set up that, that were just, you know, web cameras nonstop. Someone pops out of a doorway with a machine gun or a rocket-propelled grenade thinking they're going to take them out, and then <sighs> fire comes out of their mouth and just smokes them. So when these guys die, it's going to be global news. And while the talking heads are trying to figure out what the significance is of all of these, uh, all of this, people are rejoicing. Check out verse 10. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and make merry and exchange presents. Because these two prophets had been a torment to those who dwell on the earth. We unpack that phrase those who dwell on the earth last week. It's those who are on the earth and interested with the things of the earth. And it's like Christmas in July. People are giving presents because they're so happy that these guys are finally out of the way. Their hero, the beast, has overcome these supernaturally empowered beings. And then we see the third aspect of their witness. Put this down as letter C. Their resurrection it says verse 11 but after three and a half days a breath of life from god entered them and they stood up on their feet and great fear fell on all of those who saw them no wonder they are afraid these guys were unkillable for three and a half years and now they rise from the dead of course they will be afraid. I wonder if they'll still have the cameras on at that point. Um, probably. But then a third witness speaks up. Uh, verse 12. You can put this down as Roman numeral number three. Almost finished. And that is the testimony of heaven. Check out verse 12. It says, Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. <laughs> Trying to deepen my voice there. And they went up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies watched them. doesn't say this, but I'm pretty sure jaws are dropped, right? And at that hour, there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city collapsed. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake, and the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe has passed. And behold, the third woe is to come. Remember that third woe is our seventh trumpet. We're going to look at that next week. Come up here. There will come a day when God the Father will tell the archangel standing by the throne enough below the trumpet. And the dead in Christ will rise and those who are alive and remain will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. We are all we Christians are all going to experience that one on one side or another. My pastor in Bellingham used to say that when Jesus called Lazarus to come out of the grave and said, Lazarus, come forth, it was a good thing he said the name Lazarus or the entire graveyard would have come alive again. I want to close by asking a couple questions. What witness has God given you? What witness has God given you? Second question. To whom is your life a testimony? Who are you testifying to? 
Friends, when God provides an opening for you to testify, you need to be obedient. And when you are, the Holy Spirit has an opportunity in from working from within your heart to bring a supernatural element to your testimony. Wow. Isn't that exciting? It is exciting. I'm going to close with a brief word of prayer and invite you to just join with me as we pray for God's Holy Spirit to nudge us this week as we go about this sin-sick world as the body of Christ and try to engage for the gospel. I also encourage you to, uh, well, let me pray and then we'll talk a little bit more. Father, thank you for your word. We know that you desire that we do not be silent about what you have done in our lives, but God, rather that our entire life would be a testimony to your goodness and your greatness. And so, God, we ask you to give us open doors, bring opportunities our way to share our faith, invite people to this, to listen in on this study from Revelation. Lord, invite them to church. Listen, send a link to listen online. We invite God that we ask that when you do open a door, when you bring an opportunity, that we would open our mouth, that we would be obedient to testify. And then, Holy Spirit, as you work within us and through us, and you give us this amazing opportunity and privilege that we would. I pray that you would open the hearts of those who would hear. Open doors, open mouths, and open hearts that you might use your word to transform lives and in doing so, transform the very communities we live in. We are so desperately in need of that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I really do encourage you to uh, share this link with a friend or go down to the little button and click subscribe that that way you'll get an email update anytime we post uh, something uh, on this channel and so hey it's been great to be with you today and I uh, hope you're enjoying it's summertime here at the at the time on the day that I'm recording this and so I'm gonna go get out on my little red scooter and go have fun check on some people that I care about who are uh, having a struggle and we'll be back here next week thanks very much appreciate you being here god bless